chapter 9 tonight, 1 Samuel chapter 9, and we are in that transition period where we're looking at the transition in Israel uh, from having judges and to having a king. So 1 Samuel chapter 9, look at that transition, and we actually looked at it last week, but if you can find chapter 9, then we're going to just read uh, the first two verses of chapter 9, we're going to jump over to chapter 13, read the first verse. And then we'll do, uh, in, as we go through our, our message this evening, we'll do a lot of reading of the text because it tells a story and, of course, it naturally flows or follows in a way that you can't duplicate any other way than simply reading the text as part of what we're looking at. So here we are, chapter 9, verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphiah, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. Now, now before we read verse 2, it's interesting we're reading this to hear about Saul. And I believe that the significance of, of uh, giving the lineage or the background of Saul is that Saul could have been that messianic king of Israel. We're going to see that in our context this evening. And so his lineage was important, you know, just as far as recording it, uh, partly because of what could have been. And then verse 2, he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a gooder, I mean goodlier, uh, person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And then over to chapter 13 and verse 1, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel. We'll just stop there. That'll be our context this evening. Well, let's read verse 1 again. And then we'll, we'll just ask the Lord to guide us as we uh, seek to see his heart in the context this evening. Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, let's pray. Father, please, please, tonight, just help to settle us in our minds and our hearts in a way that we could first rightly <clears throat> divide the word. Also, God, it's our desire this evening to really see that place where you are, high and lifted up, to come from a position of being recipients of your love, and to really just know how you think as our Heavenly Father, so that we could think like you do. We pray that you'll help us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So not last week because we had Evangelist Bill Rice last Sunday night, but the week before we were in 1 Samuel, as we were looking at uh, the transition period, this turning over, and we saw Israel come to a place where they repented of having asked God, or really demanded from God, a king. And it, it, it was really a help for us, as we saw, it wasn't anything on the part of Saul that was wrong, it was on the part of the children of Israel. And the fact is, is that they really hadn't rejected Samuel as their judge. They had rejected God, as, and they didn't want to be a theocracy anymore. They wanted to be like the other nations and have a king that was over them. You know, God knows all these things. If you read through the law, when the law was established with Israel, uh, they were told, don't have a king like the other nations, and when you do, don't let him, and he gave rules for a king. Uh, and, you know, God's law is that way. Oftentimes we think of God's law, the law for Israel, we think of it as the this is the heart of God, but actually God's law was written because of the hearts of men, actually. And many things are in God's law because of hardness of the heart of men. And so some of the rules for kings were written because of the hardness of heart of men. Well, you're not supposed to have a king. But when you have a king, don't get one that marries a whole bunch of wives like the heathen do. You know, and so it's one of those things where you're not supposed to. This is my heart, but because of your heart, <clears throat> this is what happens after you do what you do. And we saw last week that men make decisions, they do things, and it affects, it affects a lot. But even when you turn or you repent, oftentimes there are consequences. There are consequences for behaviors, for things that you do. And we as believers have to understand that consequences aren't to frighten us. Um, God give us, God give us a heart 
uh, that loves God. I, you know, I really appreciate, in several places in the Bible it's phrased as well, but I appreciate Jude, the last several verses of Jude, about false teachers, false doctrines. And if some have compassion, making a difference. Man, it's great to have compassion on people. And it says, but others save with fear, pull, you know, uh, pulling them out of fire, hating them in the garments spotted by the flesh. You know, compassion works, doesn't it? Being compassionate toward people reaches people, and then people being afraid reaches people as well. And I am uh, just reminded that I'd rather be reached by compassion than by fear. Uh, if you're a young person, like everybody here tonight, uh, if you're a young person, heed the, the advice of Solomon in Proverbs when he says, A wise son maketh the glad father. Hear my son, the instruction of a father. There's so many instructions in Proverbs about, uh, about listening to wisdom and heeding wisdom. Why? Well, because you don't have to have consequences. If you don't do wrong, you won't have the consequences for wrongdoing. There's no problem going through life with tribulation, <coughs> persecution. It's going to happen. If you're one of these individuals that rejects the notion that a believer should suffer, my friend, uh, you're going to miss out on God doing a lot of things. That's all fine and good, but when you have consequences because of your sin, it's a different matter. And that is what Israel had. And they repented, and God said, yeah, now you got a king. They didn't just repent, and God said, okay, you know what? I think maybe at that point Saul would have been willing to say, okay, I, you know, I didn't want to be the king in the first place. And so, but God said, no, nope, you made your decision, and now, uh, now you're going to have a king, and also I'm going to hold you accountable just the same way as I did before. And that was what we saw last week. See, what they thought was that they could put an authority between them and God, but God is still their authority. You know, a lot of people want to do that. It's sort of like when you run away and join the military sort of thing. I haven't heard that joke in a long time, but, you know, the, the rebellious kid that doesn't want to be under authority, so he joins the Marines, you know, so he can do what he wants to do, and that sort of thing. And that's sort of what, the, what National Israel did. They said, you know, God, we don't want, we just, we just don't want to be under your authority. We want to be under the authority of a king. And God said, well, here's a king, and so he can take your daughters and, and uh, make them servants and, and uh, make them his wives and tax you and and to, uh, you know, make you go to war and all these things. And I'm still God. Nothing's changed about me. And so you're going to answer to me just the same as you always did before. <laughs> Be, watch out. Look out. Look out for what you put yourself under. And uh, you can get yourself a bad authority and still have God be your authority. God's always God. Don't forget that. That's the lesson we learned last week. We didn't really look at the person of Saul <coughs> and uh, tragically, we don't have time to spend a lot of time on Saul. I love Saul uh, as a person. What a great man he was. What a great young man he was. And I love the description of him in uh, cha chapter 9 and verse 2. He was goodly. Goodly. And so, uh, <clears throat> ladies, I want to warn you about looking out for goodly fellows because this one didn't turn out so good. Uh, it, so he could do gooder than that, I think, I'm pretty sure. But he was a choice young man and goodly. And he stood out. <clears throat> Literally, he stood, the Bible says, from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. And by the way, this is a little extra, but this is why I love this portion of the Scripture. I love uh, Joshua, uh, Judges, uh, Ruth as well, Mrs. Dawes. I like Ruth. Okay. Uh, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. Because everything is told, it's, it, they're historical books, and so everything is told from a position of uh, like a story. And so when I got grounded when I was a kid and got told the only book you can read is the Bible, I got grounded from reading. I don't know if you all ever got grounded from reading, but I was a nerd, and uh, I read a lot. And so sometimes my mom would speak to me, and I wouldn't hear her because I was in another world. I was in a book world. And so she'd say, you know, you read too much. You're not going to be reading for a while. And so the only thing you can read is the Bible. And so this is where I went. Because it's interesting here. Good stories. And uh, I would encourage you read in, read in these portions of Scripture because there are marvelous examples of courage. And if you're into 
uh, drama or plays or that sort of thing, my goodness, there is just some great material for examples and stuff. I mean, just fascinating. Uh, you know, has it ever bothered you that they just don't make good movies when there's this kind of stuff? I mean, couldn't you have a Saul movie, a Jonathan movie? I mean, just Jonathan would, you know, a movie titled Jonathan. That'd be a great movie, wouldn't it? One of the greatest men ever. And uh, just, you know, super guy. And they do, but they don't have, I mean, you just read it. And what I see in my mind is just incredible, incredible, incredible. So anyway, Saul, uh, the Bible says he was, a, he was a goodly man, and it also says from his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any of the people. So all the men in Israel standing up, and Saul's with them, and they're right here, come up right here, you know, to I mean, he's a big guy. And uh, probably it, 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 it seems from the description that I'm not big and gangly, just a, you know, good-looking guy. You ever notice usually the real big guys are the nice ones as well? Like, you know, the description of Saul really is gentle giant. He gets made king of Israel, and he goes and hides in a basket. You know, like, I don't want to be anybody's king. I don't want to, you know, this real, but he was a good man, and he was a great king. You read the description of Saul and his attitude when he became king. <clears throat> and friend, you won't find a better man or better qualified man than Saul to be king of Israel. He had the humility that was necessary. He had the courage that was necessary. He was a courageous man in spite of the fact that he you know, didn't want to be the king. Man, when, it, when push came to shove and he had to go to battle, he really did it. And that brings us to our story this evening. And the, the message this week and maybe the next couple of weeks is that people change. People change. Uh, you know, sometimes there is a lot of conventional wisdom that's just flawed. Remember this morning we were talking about conventional wisdom, how that a lot of times uh, people will make statements like everyone's replaceable, and it's a statement people make, but it's not true. It's not true. If everyone was replaceable, God would have never made you. God made you in a way that only you can fill the shoes, only you can fulfill the purpose that God has planned for your life. You say, Pastor, does that mean people will go to hell uh, you know, or, or, or people, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, people go to hell, that sort of thing. You know what? God made a lot of people, but you are uniquely qualified to reach people no one else is. And you can ask all these, you know, hypothetical, theory, theoretical questions and so forth, but the reality of it is that God has a plan and a purpose and specific to you, and you're not replaceable. You're not replaceable. You're the only person that can be exactly who God wants you to be. And you take your role in every relationship, in every circumstance where God has placed you very, very seriously. And you'll see God use you. Wasn't it neat yesterday? We, we were just talking about this, weren't we, in our salvation, our, in our, um, uh, what do we call it, our soul winning saturation on Saturdays? And we were talking about just being the person. Wasn't it neat last night to see the people that only some people could reach that were there? You know, we were talking about in soul winning saturation, how that you are the person to reach the people that surround you. And we just saw that with the visitors last night, didn't we? There were people there last night that only the person that invited them could have gotten them to come and hear the gospel. And that's just really the truth. So conventional wisdom, don't buy into it. And what we just stated a minute ago is a statement that people never change. Can I say to you that people do change? And people change. You know, they say, well, that's you know, just what they always were. No, people change for bad. People change from good to evil and people change from evil to good, depending on their response to God. And this is a tragic story, really. Uh, I've, I'll just admit to you, I've popped a tear for Saul and Jonathan. <laughs> I've, I've cried over Jonathan. Have you ever? You ever read the story of Jonathan and just think of what might have been had his father made different life choices? You, you find me one wrong that Jonathan ever did. Jonathan was one of the best men who ever lived. He was courageous. Uh, he, was, he, he had humility. He was the package. He was everything his dad was and more when his dad was a good guy. But God rejected Jonathan from being king because of Saul. And I always felt badly for Jonathan until I realized, you know, Jonathan didn't feel badly for himself. And so he wanted David to be king anyway. 
And, you know, he didn't have jealousy. He realized, God doesn't want me to be king. I'm, it's not, that's not mine. It's not my inheritance. What a good guy Jonathan was. And by the way, Saul raised a better son. Saul raised a better son, really, than any of David's, including Solomon started well. But you think about it, Jonathan ended well and was, was a good man. So I want you to take that in consideration. I want to say that uh, people change, and sometimes people change for bad. Sometimes people change, and God can change people for good. And God could have changed Saul for good. So let's read the story. Verse 2. Uh, he reigned two years over Israel, and Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, where of 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah. But you notice Jonathan gets 1,000, Saul gets two. You know, you'd be like, well, I'm the adult here, and so I only need 1,000 because of my leader. No, Jonathan, Jonathan's a guy with 1,000. Now you say it could be matchups, and that's, it could have been. And it could be because uh, Saul was king and people wanted to follow him. But I just, I think it's interesting. So in verse 3, Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines, that, <coughs> that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say, that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also was had in abomination with the Philistines. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. Now, this is what I like about Jonathan. <laughs> I mean, Saul, Saul took the, more the weight of the responsibility of a boy. Who was it that smote the garrison of the Philistines? Jonathan. It was Jonathan that did it with his thousand guys. And the Philistines heard about it. And now the Israelites are in some trouble with the Philistines because, you know, you guys, you want to fight? You're making war with us. And so now Saul is saying to the nation of Israel, you know, uh, we've got to put up or shut up. <laughs> we're either going to get killed or we're going to fight. That's sometimes a good place to be in. And I like that about Jonathan. I like it about Saul, don't you? I, I, I like about Jonathan that he's the kind of person that says, you know, God didn't tell us to come into the land of Canaan to be slaves. And God didn't tell us to come into the land of Canaan and live with the Philistines. Did he? No, God wanted to be free, and uh, he wanted them to drive out the people that were in the land. And so Jonathan's one of these, you know, take the bull by the horns kind of guy. He said, well, let's get this party started. Let's go fight the garrison of the Philistines. He wasn't a terrorist. He can go kill some children or whatever. He went and fought the warriors, fought the men with a thousand of his guys, and word got out. And then Saul's response was great as well. He said, folks, it appears like we're in a lot of trouble here. And we're either going to die or we're going to live, but it depends on how you respond, so come fight. And so here's what happened. <clears throat> in verse 4, uh, all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines and that Israel also was had an abomination <laughs> with the Philistines. You don't want to be had an abomination with people unless you're ready to do something about it. And the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. And the Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel. Now notice this, 30,000 chariots. 30,000 chariots, not 30,000 footmen, 30,000 chariots. And that's a pretty formidable. We're talking about Saul had 2,000 men, Jonathan had 1,000 men, and the Philistines have 30,000 chariots. Can we say that these things have just got to be very, very serious? Any person who's into any kind of strategy knows that <clears throat> there are some reasons for a person with only 2,000 soldiers to be concerned. Now, uh, 6,000 horsemen. Okay, so 30,000, that makes 36,000. And then, uh, you know, people as the sandwiches on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Mitch Mass eastward from Beth Avon. I can't really visualize this, so I can only joke about it by talking about the ants, which I'm doing battle with in my house right now. Uh, I had them wiped out a few weeks ago, and they came back. They, uh, it's interesting how the ants seem to do it. It seems like they talk. You hear, you, can you hear ants talking in your mind? Like, yeah, he tried to wipe us out, but we build up an immunity to it, so let's just stay back here. Let's fortify and get strong, and build a bunch of mounds, and destroy his yard. And then on Tuesday, everybody line up. And they do, they all line up and they march. 
and they march from all directions. They march in the patio window, they march in the patio door, they march in the front door, uh, they make little lines and march in, they find little marching lines, and I mean, you come out and they have set things in array. I will do the only thing that ants aren't immune to thing, you know, we sit there and, you know, they have a game on your phone, you can just come by my house right now, you don't need a game, but, uh, you know, the uh, killing the ants thing, you know, and I'll do that. I'll have them all wiped out. My, my wife's bothered by ants on the kitchen, in the kitchen. She doesn't like ants in the kitchen. I don't know why ants don't bother me in the kitchen. You know, they, they only bother me if they get stuck between my teeth. But other than that, <laughs> they don't trouble me too much. But I want to tell you something. Those rascals set themselves in array. I mean, you know, there's not an ant in sight anywhere. And then a crumb. You know, you're doing dishes and a piece of rice or something comes off a plate and sits on the counter. I'm the only person in the world, you probably think, Pastor, what a messy house you have having ants. Yeah, my wife can't do dishes right now. It's me. So, rough. But, uh, but you, you know, you got a crumb on the countertop. And you come out two seconds later and there are like 40 ants converging, circling, and then they give out the signals and the army start marching. And so, I, you know... The Philistines are like the sands of the seashore. Now, I've been to the seashore and seen the sand there. I just can't imagine that many soldiers. But there were 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and then footmen like the sands of the seashore. And Saul had 2,000 soldiers and Jonathan had 1,000. <laughs> That's a little bit of a problem. Can, could you... Could we say that there was a great deal of weight on those big, tall, strong shoulders of Saul at this time? And you know, think about being leadership at this time. You know, I, this is where in Saul's place I'd be saying, you know, I never grew up dreaming about being king. I don't want to be king. I never asked to be king. You ever been in that situation where it's like, well, you're in the exalted position? I don't want to be in the exalted position. Never did. I was happy looking for my dad's donkeys. And, you know, that, that was the kind of thing I was into and uh, for such a time as this, Saul. Uh, when, in verse 6, when the men of Israel saw they were in a strait, <laughs> that's a good way of putting it, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks <coughs> and in high places <coughs> and in pits. Notice this. How did the children of Israel get, how did they get across Jordan the first time? What? On dry land. On dry land, yeah. These guys, nobody parted the waters and they left anyway. Just think about that, okay? So it says, in, and uh, some of the Hebrews went over Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. <laughs> they, well, guys, let's get ready to fight. There's the Philistines. Hey, where is everybody? And they're walking off. They're leaving. They're hiding in caves. They're hiding in the, in the thickets and in rocks, <coughs> and in high places. I mean, just anywhere they can go that they think that it will be too much effort for the Philistines to bother chasing them, they go. And some of them swam the Rio Grande, or swam the Jordan, and got out of Dodge, if you will. And verse 8, he tarried seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Boy, this is a difficult lesson. It's a difficult lesson to learn. It's a difficult lesson to teach, to be quite honest with you, because I can relate to Saul's predicament, can't you? If, if I don't have the perspective of the Word of God here, and Saul calls me up and he says, Hey, brother, I'm in a little bit of a situation I'm not going to say, I'll, I'll come over and help you. I'm going to say, what's the situation? And he says, well, uh, Jonathan went and attacked a garrison of the Philistines. And there's about 36,000 chariots and horsemen and, and a multitude of uh, soldiers, like, kind of like the sand on the seashore. And uh, what do you think I should do? <clears throat> Saul, you still big, too big to crawl into that cave at night? <laughs> you know, uh, 
You know, figure. You know, you might want to try and see if you can get a cheap rope of, you know, do the Jordan thing. What's he supposed to do? He's in a predicament, isn't he? He's in a predicament. The most natural thing to do for somebody who knows God is the most unnatural thing to do for somebody who's about to really make a mess out of things. See, Saul should have just got on his face. Friend, can I say to you that God wants us to have situations in our life where there's nothing we can do. God would like you to know that there is nothing He cannot do. And you know, the most natural thing oftentimes we do in a circumstance like Saul's is look at a situation and say, this is totally impossible, and then try to do something. Let's think on that logically for a minute. Think on it logically for a minute. If there's nothing you can do, what do you think the outcome is going to be when you try to do something? No, I'm not. What's that? You're going to fail. This is a no-win situation. And friend, the matter of resting and saying, Here, God, is so simple and so often <laughs> overlooked. It's a test of faith, isn't it? For Saul, this is a moment where it's, do you believe in a God who can do anything? Do you remember how we came to be here? It's really that moment for Saul where he has to come to the place and he has to remember, how did we get in Canaan? Well, we crossed over on dry land, that's how. Now, now who made that possible? How did we get past Jericho? Well, God leveled it for us. That's what made that possible. What happened at Ai? Well, we took our eyes off of God, and we got sin in our lives. You know, Saul had just been a witness with Israel when Samuel brought the accusation of God against them. Samuel started the conversation like this. Uh, he told them their history, and he, had, he asked the question, he said, uh, have I ruled well over you? Have I ever, do you? Does anybody have any, anything against me? No, Samuel. Let God be the witness that you have nothing against me. And here we got nothing against you, Samuel. And then he brought his accusation. God brought you in the promised land. God gave you this judge and this judge and this judge and this judge and delivered you every time you went and worshipped Ashtaroth and Baal and, and uh, God, brought, God brought you in bondage. <clears throat> and then God delivered you every time and now you want a king. And boy, they repented. Saul was part of that. And now here they are in a situation where the Philistines are come out against them in a multitude, and they're in a real predicament. <clears throat> and no king can deliver them. My friend, when you're in a situation when there's nothing anyone can do, there's only one person who can do anything, and it's God. It's a real telling circumstance who you look to in that time. It's a telling circumstance. And this is where we see good people change. We see Saul making the wrong decision. And so Samuel should have been there. Does everybody agree with that? I mean, for all Saul knows, Samuel cut and ran. He fled. Saul said, bring hither a burnt offering to me. and peace offerings, and he offered the burnt offering. Well, Pastor, Saul was just trying to, <clears throat> trying to talk to God. Well, Saul was just trying to do what he had no right to do. That's what he was doing. So he didn't know. Yes, he did. He would have never had to ask. Isn't it amazing how we play the I didn't really know game when we really did? He wouldn't have had a problem with Samuel not being there if he didn't think that Samuel... What was the point in having a priest offer the offering if priests weren't supposed to offer it? It's just common sense, isn't it? So he overlooked the common sense thing. And the Bible says, And it came to pass as soon as they made an end of offering the burnt offering. Behold, Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. Samuel said, Hello, how you been doing? 
No, he didn't. Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw the people were scattered from me, that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. That next three words, I forced myself, therefore. You know, Saul would have been better off running and hiding. The honest truth of the matter is if there's nothing he could do, doing something he wasn't permitted by God to do is not the response. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And then notice verse 13, then, then Saul, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Please note that the word foolish in the word of God is not used lightly. It's not used randomly. You know, sometimes we use phrases like acting a fool or playing a fool, and, you know, we use the word fool or foolish, uh, perhaps carelessly. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. When Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, he'd done foolishly. Help me. Fools. What... What makes behavior foolish? Let's just think this through just really quickly. I know I should be done in about a minute or so, but we, we, we might. You never know. What makes, what makes behavior foolish? God says it is. What? God says it is. Okay, so God says it is. So what, playing devil's <laughs> advocate, then you don't really know unless you know what God said. I guess you could have known what God said here, right? But it's not described as foolish. In other words, it could be kind of after the fact, right? It's easy to look in hindsight, being 2020, and say, well, that was foolish. But what makes behavior foolish, by the definition of the word fool or foolish? What makes behavior foolish? You do something that's going to ruin you. Hey, something's going to ruin you. Could you say that a fool does something that a person with common sense wouldn't? Yeah, either dumb without thinking or ignoring counsel. Uh, foolishness and ignorance aren't normally the same thing. Foolishness normally happens because of a careless attitude. It's usually a person behaving foolishly is a person who's reckless. Reckless about consequence. Uh, we saw a bad one on the way back from Miami Beach. Two uh, little Hondas that ran terrible, were racing on I-95, and they cut off a couple cars and caused a terrible accident right in front of us. You know, and, and two guys, I don't know if the consequences of their actions have hit them, but they hurt some people. And they, you know, they just, they wrecked a lot of people's days, literally. And it was, just, you know, racing and, and busy <coughs> traffic is foolish. Another guy was riding a wheelie for a couple of miles, and then doing crazy stunts on a wheelie, going up an off-ramp, and that's become really popular. And whenever I see that, I, I want to close my eyes when I drive, which is not safe. That would be foolish. <laughs> uh, but I always think, I don't want to watch you get killed. I don't want to see it. You know, because, you know, you do that enough, and you, you're going to get either badly hurt or killed. It's just going to happen. I used to ride a motorcycle, and I know enough to know you do foolish things enough, and you're going to get hurt or killed. What makes it foolish? Fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay, yeah. Well, that's kind of Saul, isn't it? Kind of, well, you know, doesn't matter what God said. Sort of ignoring God, isn't it? Sort of. Okay, so that's a foolish person, a person that ignores God. Uh, doing something is probably going to have bad results and just hoping it works. You know, just, just careless, reckless, uh, defiant. You know, fools are, are rebellious, aren't they? God doesn't say you have to be the sharpest tool in the shed. He doesn't say you have to be incredibly smart. You don't, it's not intelligence we're rating here. We're talking about taking the data that you have and just computing it. We're not talking about intelligence. We're talking about reckless, reckless self-endangerment. That's what, Paul, what Saul did. Just endangered himself for no reason. He didn't have to do it. We know what drove him. 
he felt like somebody needs to do something. And everybody's looking at me and everybody's walking away from me. And if I don't do something now, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Man, people make bad mistakes that way. Don't make financial decisions that way. How many people buy a car because they broke down this morning and they don't know how they're going to get to work? And so they just pay for a car for five years. Hey, either quit your job or <clears throat> skip work for a day. It'll cost a lot less. I, I'm not, what, you know, that's not something that, you know, is a big deal to me. But it's amazing how a person will make a five-year payment decision because they need to get to work right now. Just, well, think about what that'll cost you in the long run. Uh, a fool never counts the cost, does he? Never counts the cost. He looks at his situation and thinks, if I could get beyond this situation, I don't care about anything else. And that was Saul's attitude. Got to do something, anything. And he'd been better doing nothing. Well, let's just look at the outcome, the result of it. Uh, in verse 13, Samuel said, Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Notice we looked at the little bit of the genealogy of Saul. And we look at what God wanted to do for Saul. What did God want to do for Saul? God wanted to establish his kingdom. Now, Davidic is easier to say than Solidic or Solific or whatever. But it could have been Saul. It could have been Jonathan. It could have been those guys. God could have done a great thing. You know, Saul was a great man when he was anointed king of Israel, wasn't he? He was an impressive guy. He was a humble guy. Saul became a fool. Became a fool because he acted recklessly. Samuel said, you didn't listen. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. <coughs> so we see he disobeyed. And then, that's it. We're going to see Saul later in the next couple of weeks. Um, but God delivered, God delivered Saul and used Jonathan instrumentally to do it. Well, what good is it for Saul now to be king of Israel? God's rejected him. And what do we see here? Well, we see a couple of things. You know, there are some statements, aren't there? There are individuals that believe in... Uh, does everybody here believe in God's sovereignty? I do. Don't, don't uh, let people turn good words uh, by redefining them into bad words. Uh, but God could have done something with Saul. And Saul made a decision. It wasn't out of God's control. God had a response. God knew what to do. God wasn't ever uh, threatened by Saul's decision. But it sure wrecked Saul's life. You ever think of the ramifications of, of Saul's decisions just for his family? <coughs> I wouldn't want my daughter to marry David. Would you? Be honest with you. Uh, a man after God's own heart had a good relationship with God. He was the worst husband probably recorded in the Scripture. And a worse father than he was a husband. And Saul basically offered both his daughters to David. Jonathan would have been a great king. And Saul wrecked the opportunity for that for Jonathan, such as it was. Saul, his entire kingdom is, is thought of, for the most part, as negative. Two years. Two years, he was a good king. Two years. And for about 40 years, he was terrible. It's too bad, isn't it? Is it what God wanted? 
for Saul? No, it's not. Friend, don't play the sovereignty game and blame God. Well, you know, God worked it for God can work anything for good. He does. But God could do a great thing in your life if you just learn when you're in a situation that's beyond your control to say, God, this situation is beyond my control. What did Saul have to do in this circumstance? Get on his knees and pray. Yeah. Just didn't have to do anything at all. Right? I mean, he would have claimed, well, I'm offering a peace offering to God. I'm offering an <coughs> offering to God. I'm praying. Not really. He, he just had to go like this and say, your people, God. Your problem, God. And we will see countless examples where individuals go, God, your people. God, your problem. And God says, got this. And that's what God could have done with Saul. Tragically, instead, Saul, in this one moment, is rejected from having his throne established. And it gives you an idea of the mindset of God toward individuals who respond the wrong way when faced with a decision that requires faith. Now, I cannot this evening foretell or predict what it will be in your life, but there will be a decision in your life when you're just going to have to say, God, I don't know what to do, and so I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to let you do it. He's real, isn't he? Do you believe in God? Is he real? Does he really answer prayer? Can he really work circumstances that you and I cannot? And the answer is he always does. He's always faithful. But you have to trust him, and the alternative is to play the fool. And that's the example we see this evening of people changing for bad. Father, please help us to realize we could change for bad, we could go from being a faithful, profitable servant to behaving foolishly and consequently, God, making it so that we cannot be useful. And I just pray that you protect us and show us these things in our lives for application. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.